We got to do this again. How are we doing? Great. Wow. Um, okay, I feel better now after a prayer time and all of that. That was uh, a blessing. What week are we? Three? Okay. I had to make sure I had the right notes here. Uh, welcome, everybody, this morning. We are uh, in week three out of uh, eight, nine, ten, somewhere in there. Um, I'm not going to set an end date to this um, because even though we have a plan, you know how that goes, right? And so um, we are in week three of our faith foundations. We have been talking about um, foundation matters in week one. We talked about what it looks like and why we need a solid foundation. And then last week, we talked about what it meant to be born again. And what that looks like is, as we went through scripture where uh, Jesus is talking, unless you're born of water and of spirit, you know, you can't be born again. And the importance of that and, and what that looks like. And then Wednesday, oh, I bit my mouth again. Wednesday nights, um, we've been meeting and digging in deeper. And that has been such a blessing. Um, I talked to Rose this morning and uh, she called me nice and early. It must be a different time zone there where she's at. I don't know. But she called me early. And she says, oh, I'm getting so much out of the Wednesday nights. That's so good because she's watching them. And what about the Sunday? I mean, can we, you know, I, I need, I felt like I needed a, a, something. She's like, oh, I'm getting so much out of that Wednesday night. That is so good. I'm not sure if she was messing with me or she's just saying how great of a job you are. I, she's keeping me humbled. I, there are times where I feel like I need that affirmation sometimes. And then I think, well, no, that's for me. And so anyway, um, we're going to continue on. Um, this next two weeks is we're talking about ministering. And, and that's kind of a word we don't use a, a lot, but we're going to do this kind of uh, this week. We're going to look at it vertical and next week horizontal. Uh, this week, we're going to look at what that looks like to minister to the Lord, to be worshiping the Lord, and then what it looks like next week to be ministering to each other, the body. And so um, I'm excited about it. I'm really excited about it. Um, this is one of those things. I have to be honest with you. Um, when we were going through the Faith Foundations outline and, and what we wanted to talk about each week and that and I see ministering to the Lord, I had to Google what that actually meant. I mean, because that's not something uh, that, we, that we say a lot of the time. And so as we read the scripture we're going to read today, um, we'll look at what that looks like to worship. And um, this uh, in Paul, let's see, where is it? So we're going to be ministering to the Lord. Um, did you know that ministering to the Lord, that worshiping God is actually the purpose of the church? And so we're going to talk about the purpose of that this week in worship. And next week, we're going to be looking at the obligation of the church to, to raise up believers. And so in uh, Colossians 3.16, Paul says this. He says, sing psalms and hymns and songs with thanksgiving in your heart to God. Not just because of God, but to God. And we think about that when we are praying and when we're praising, when we're up here just singing the songs and, and singing the hymns, and we're praising and we're praying this, are we doing it for us or are we doing it like to God, for God, like we know that he can deal and he can take care of all things, right? And so we're going to look at what that looks like in worship in the church. Um, I wrote this down because this, I, I read this. And so I wrote it down that worship in the church is not just preparation for something else. It's not just preparation for something else. It is fulfilling the purpose of the church as it relates to our relationship with God. I'm going to read that again because it's so good. You know, this is one of those things. If you, if I, I want to make sure we get this. Worship in the church is not just preparation for something else. It is fulfilling the purpose of the church as it relates to our relationship with God. And next week, we're going to look at what it means to minister to believers. And it's an obligation of the church uh, to build up believers in the faith. Like we have to build each other up. And we need to make sure that we are moving towards becoming mature believers. That we're not just staying right where we were. You know, when we were kids, we did childish things. But as we grew up, we got away from those things. We didn't do the childish things. We did the adulting things, right? And it's like, sometimes it's like, can we just go back to the childish ways of doing stuff? And then I see the th childish things that my kids do. And some of it, I go, no, I'm good, right? And so uh, I want to pray for us. And then we're going to jump in uh, to this. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that we can come to the, together this morning and celebrate what you're doing um, around us. Now we may not always see it as celebration. We may not always have joy. We may not always see it as going uh, the way we planned on things to go. But Lord, we know that you have made every single one of us for a purpose to fulfill your will, that in using all of us together as one body, and when we pray and when we worship and when we give you all the glory, Father, there is a, there's just that sweet scent. There's that sweet taste. There's that pleasing Father. 
Holy Spirit, fill this place this morning with your wisdom, with your, with your joy, with your, with your guidance. Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit fills this place so full this morning that I don't even have to say a word. We just hear you speak. So I ask that in this time that we're sharing your word this morning, that we're receiving your word, that, that through expectant anticipation of joy and prayer and praise this morning, that we can give you all the glory. All the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Are you guys okay if I start off with a psalm this morning? Okay. Uh, you can go to Psalm 100. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's some blue ones in the front. It's actually page, uh, the top right of page 427 in those blue Bibles. If you want to look there. I looked it up this morning. You see, that I was prepared. I don't know why. But anyway, so Psalm 100. And this is one of those fun psalms. It's only five verses. So we're going to read an entire psalm this morning, right? And so Psalm 100, um, it, it goes like this. It says, shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. That's odd, right? Shout. We should shout. It says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise give thanks to him and praise him for the lord is good and his love endures forever the faithfulness continues or his faithfulness continues through all generations there's a lot of joy and a lot of praise and a lot of thanksgiving there's a lot going on right there and it's like there's times i just want to pray and, and just be like in a somber and just like sit in and just dwell and he's like okay bring that to me put it at my feet but you've got to praise you have to come with thanksgiving you've got to know that out of that there's going to be joy right if we pray expectant prayers if we worship with expectant uh, love from the father right and so i wanted to start with that psalm because i, I want to set the stage of where we're heading today um when we come into his presence of the lord there's a mood and, and an attitude and a posture right it's like when you go to a um to a, a party a birthday party as a kid there's an attitude that you go with like this is going to be a lot of fun somebody's getting gifts i'm going to take home a goodie bag and there's going to be a lot of sugar right and so when we come to him and pray in the presence of the lord there's a mood and attitude and posture with that we can't come upset or mad it's a distraction we can't come upset or mad we're su we're not supposed to do this church thing as an obligation well, it's Sunday, 1030, and I'll get in trouble if I don't go. Right, boys? <laughs> no. Uh, it's like, it, it, we can't see it as an obligation. We're not supposed to do this because it's a spiritual, religious, spiritual thing. It's just a re religious act that we do every Sunday. That's what America does. That's what the world does. So we'll just do it because of that. Right? We are supposed to experience His presence with gladness. When we come to church, when we sit in this building, we invite the Holy Spirit into this place. We praise Jesus for what he did on the cross for us. And we give it all the glory to God because we have expected, there's an expected attitude and appreciation and thanksgiving that goes along with that. If we just come in here and sit down and listen to the songs and listen to me yap up here for a little bit and we throw a little money in and we take communion and we don't even think about it if we don't have any kind of attitude or, or thankfulness or gratefulness for, for all that, then, then why would we do it right we have to come into his presence and it's all about our heart yeah. our act of worship should come from our heart and not from the obligation or guilt right. and that's there's uh, there's so much more we could take just that and do an, an entire series we can take it with parenting we can take it with uh, marriage we can take it with uh, anything you know jesus is the center of our life so we're going to talk about this a little bit later um but and I don't know which week it is, I think maybe five, and we're actually going to talk about giving. And that's not, I don't know that I've ever talked about giving up here, but we're going to talk about how giving isn't based on obligation or guilt either. It comes from the heart, right? We're going to talk about it. We're going to dig into that, and you'll learn some more Wednesday uh, of this week. We're going to look at distractions, and things that get in the way of, of, of our worship and things that get in the, the way of, of our prayers. It's, you know, the sins in our life, the conflicts we deal with, the selfish motives, it's just a few. I could name a bunch more because there's a, there's a handful um, as I was looking through that. Um, I, am I the only one that gets distracted with things? 
Like, I mean, I know you've seen me get distracted just from here. Yet yeah, Lucy says, yes, yeah, just you. Thanks, Lucy. Like, there are constant things in our lives that are going to distract us from worshiping God. There's going to be things in our lives that's going to try and distract us from having that relationship with Christ. We're going to talk about our first love. Uh, Wednesday, no, Sunday. What was youth group? Sunday night. Um, it's already been a week. I'm already forgetting where I'm at. So last Sunday, we're going through a series with our youth called Revision. And one of the things that we talked about is what is the biggest distraction that keeps us from spending time with the Lord? And you know what the number one thing was? They said school. <laughs> school, like really? But yeah, is that what you said, school also? When, when, no, I was saying nice try. Yeah, nice try. Yeah. So, but then they were like, yeah, social media, you know, other things. Yeah. So there's always going to be distractions and I, and you can look at the distractions our youth have and know that the enemy is attacking them. Everything they can do to do that. And so the cares of the world and the cares of what people say and do, there's always going to be tactics and lies. It's, there's always going to be, the enemy is always going to be under attack or trying to find ways to throw that off. Um, I saw a statistic um, that I wanted to share with you guys. I came across this 10 years ago. Do you know what percent of Americans claim to be Christians? Just take a wild guess. It's more than 70, less than 80. Close, 76. So 10 years ago, 76% of Americans claimed to be Christians. You know what it is now? Who said 63? They knew the answer from, yes, 63. That's a little bit of a drop in 10 years. That's more than 1% a year. I just did the math right there in my head. It's genius, right? That's more than 1%. It went from 76% to 63%. Why? Distractions. I'm going to chalk it up to a couple things. One of it for our younger families is distractions. Also for our younger families, I think the older families quit sharing the gospel. I think they're distracted. And so that's another thing we talk about this is that the only way the church is going to grow, not just numerically, but spiritually, is if the, if the parents are pouring into the youth because the youth and their younger generation, they are the next one coming up. And if it's the oldest, oldest generation that's trying to pour into the youngest generation, it's not going to happen. It's going to work a little bit, but we have to have that next generation above pointing to the one behind because when the olders were, were running the, when they were running the show, they were pouring out the gospel into that generation. They can't continue to go from that generation. They did their job. This generation needs to go here. This one needs to come alongside this one, support them and push them along. But this generation, I think that my generation, that's like the majority of us in here, right? That's like this whole middle section. Sorry to call you all out, Right. It's like, that's our generation. Like, it's like, we have these distractions. We have all this stuff going on. We have other things that have become number one in our life that, that have risen up. It's like, oh, our kids got to be the best at this and this. So we've got to put them in all year this and that, right? Well, I'll miss church a little bit. We'll, we'll catch up later. We'll watch it online. We'll do something. And there's these distractions that over and over the enemy is going to use these things to break up that family time and that pouring of the gospel into our next generation. No wonder it's dropping. I, have, I don't want to wish this upon anything, but if it stays the same in 10 years, it may be 40%. I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but I think that we need to take, we need to take the country back. Right? Like, as Christians, we need, to, like, we need a battle plan, right? And so you can claim to be a Christian, you can claim to be a follower of Jesus, but without a good foundation that we've been talking about, that's why we're talking about a good foundation. Without a good foundation, foundation it's easy to get off track and distracted. And the only way to remain close to him in relationship with him is to stay in his presence. And so that's why I want to talk about that. And the interesting thing is, is we actually get a, a warning um, from Jesus in Revelation um, about this. If you have your hand in like Psalm 100 and then like, well, the other way, flip all the way to the back to Revelation 2. And so uh, we see in Revelation, uh, John, uh, the writer of Revelation, he's writing uh, this letter to one of the, the churches of Ephesus. Right? And th so we're going to be in uh, Revelation 2, verse 2 and 3 to start. And this is, this is good. This is Jesus. This is his word speaking. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. This is really encouraging, is it not? 
Jesus is saying, hey, FCC, I see what you're doing. You're persevering. Things are, you're coming under attack. The flesh is getting in the way. They're, the enemy is trying to attack you against each other, against the outside world. They're, they're trying to be, he's trying to build up strongholds, but you're persevering. You're doing a good job. Keep doing what you're doing. It's great. I love it, right? He says the church has been through hardships, struggles, loss, persecution, slander, mockery, division, hurts, but it has not grown weary. I'm just glad that only happened in the first century. <laughs> right? Oh, man. And he, he says, you have persevered. You're going to come under attack. And this church here in Ephesus that we're talking about here, he, it was planted by Paul. This was church. And Timothy, he would have pastored this church at one time. And some of the people in the congregation would have been the Apostle John and Jesus' mom, Mary. Can you imagine trying to pastor that church? I, that's like trying to be a lifeguard in the Olympics. <laughs> I was like, why? Do they need a lifeguard? It's like trying to be Tom Brady's quarterback coach, right? <laughs> Nothing. It'll just shake your head, Bryce. All right. And then Jesus has this encouraging thing. He says, you're do I know what you do. I know you're persevering. I know you're struggling. Yes, you're going to come under attack, but you're not growing weary. You're doing these great things. And then he follows this up with verse four. Yet I hold this against you. Oh, man. Not a yet. It was going so good. I could have just stopped right there and we could have just gone home, right? Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. And here's the struggle here at Church of Ephesus and FCC. We have to be careful that we aren't doing all of the church things and doing all the good works that we do for God and don't spend time with God. Like we can come in here, we can do all the good stuff. That's why we prayed the way we prayed. I wanted to get us into the presence of God and not just pray to God, but pray with God. And if the Holy Spirit is working in this place, get used to it because we're going to keep doing it. All right? For those of you that freaked out, you'll, you'll get better. All right? So let's flip back to Psalm 100. And I want to look at verse 4. I love this. This is one of those things um, that, that I read something and then it leads to something else. You know the hyperlink way that I read things. It's, so look at verse 4. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So what are the gates and his courts that we're talking about? Remember, this is Old Testament. You know what the gates and the courts are? In the temple. Yes, Terry, it is. Can we do a quick history lesson on the temple? Can we do that? I'm going to do it anyway. Oh, come on. I'm going to do it anyway. All right, so the temple in Jerusalem, it was divided into several courts or, or areas or chambers. Um, and there are sections. And so with each court getting more restrictive, it was a little tougher to get to the center as you went to it. And um, I just was thinking about one of those Tootsie Pops. You know, how many licks? Oh, anyway, I don't know why that just came to my mind. Linda, you're supposed to help me with this. Yeah, squirrel. All right, so, they had, so the first part of the temple, it was this huge outer court with these large open gates. And this was called the Court of the Gentiles. Right, this was an area that everybody could go to. It, wasn't, it was called the court of the Gentiles because it was open to everyone, even non-Jews. And I would think about that. It's weird that it's called the court of the Gentiles when the Jews and Gentiles could go. I wonder how they thought about that. Like, you named this after the people that are, can't even go inside. Okay. Anyway, so it was open to everyone. And it would have been a public space where uh, much of the buying and selling of things like the animals for sacrifices and stuff like that. So that's what would have been going on out there. And then inside that, the next section of the temple was called, anybody know what it's called? The Court of the Women. And it's only fitting that you entered the Court of the Women through a gate called Beautiful Gate. Isn't that wonderful? All right. So this gate was guarded to ensure that only ritual, pure Jewish men and women could enter this part of the temple. Like they had somebody checking to make sure that you were, that you were pure, that you were a Jewish man or woman. I don't know how they could tell. But anyway, I, I didn't look into that. I just kept going. So inside the court of the women were uh, different chambers. So there was chambers for storing wood and oil and wine used in the temple. There's a chamber of the leper where lepers went to be purified. I'm surprised they got in that far. But anyway, then there was a treasury of the temple, which is where the widow would have given her last mite. So that was there. And the court of the women also had large balconies surrounding it where rabbis often taught. And this is where they think that whenever Jesus taught in the temple, he would have taught from this area, right? And so it says both men and women would have been able to hear his teachings. That was a good choice, right? All right, so the next part of the temple was the inner court and um, where the priests performed sacrifices. 
And so this court was entered through the, the Nicanor Gate, which had huge sweeping steps. And I looked up, why is it called that? And anyway, this guy uh, actually brought the gates for this. They were solid gold. They were huge. They were heavy. There's a whole story where his boat was starting to sink, so they threw one overboard. I don't know how much that must have weighed, but it probably sunk to the bottom, right? They got one there. They got it unloaded and turned around, and the other one had floated up and had come and followed them. So I don't know. There's this whole thing behind that. So that's why it was called. It was named after him. He was a, a big donor, So, um, which was weird. So both men and women were allowed to climb these steps and present their sacrifices, but only the Jewish men were allowed to go beyond this point. So it's getting narrowed down. It's getting a little bit more restrictive, right? And so the altar on, uh, where they performed the sacrifice, it was a huge ramp which allowed the blood to run down into collection vessels. That's, that's interesting. And these priests that went in, these Jewish men, priests, were also oversaw the fires for the burnt offerings. All right, we're getting closer to the center. The last part of the temple was actual, uh, of the building was known as the holy place, right? And, and um, this was a huge rectangular building right in the middle there, and it was only priests could enter. They were the only ones. Like, you got to this point, you had to be a Jewish priest, and you had to be pure, and you had to be, like, in good standing. And so inside there, there was a table for showbread, and there was a menorah and the sacred vessels of the temple and the altar for burning incense. And, the, and priests entered into this holy place every day to burn incense. And they'd light the, the menorah. And on the Sabbath day, they would replace the bread that was on the table. But they did not get into the innermost part of the temple. The Holy of Holies. Like the Holy of Holies was like the only place that nobody, no matter who you were, no matter how powerful you were, nothing. There was only one dude, one day a year that got to go in that. And that was the high priest. And um, I had read a story one time that they actually would tie a rope to them. So if they went into the Holy of Holies on their one day, like this is a once in a lifetime thing, and you had any sins again, or you had anything that you weren't clean, like boom, you would die right there. And they just drag your body out. Like, what in the world to be in the presence of God? That is a uh, tough challenge. One guy, one day out of the year to be in the presence of God. Okay. That is crazy. But, oh, here's the best part. Jesus changed everything. Is that not good news? In order to be in the presence of God, here's what you, now you could get to the outside walls and kind of get close to the wall, right? They still have part of that there in Jerusalem now, the, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. I've actually been to that wall, and you get to that wall, and I don't know what it is, but it's like, yeah, there's supposed to be something spiritual here, and you're like, okay, cool, and you get to the wall, and it's like, oh, there's something spiritual there. It is amazing. I love it. Um, so Jesus changes everything, and, and if we know this, we can go through the Gospels, that Jesus, he's born into the, the Virgin Mary, and he lived a perfect, sinless life, teaching and preaching and performing miracles, laying down the foundation that, to build on and he was falsely accused falsely convicted sentenced to death by men lifted up on a sinner's cross next to two criminals right those two thieves and from there he breathed his last breath and it's like what changed all right read this i want to read this out of mark 12 so if you have your hand one hand in psalm one hand in revelation you can take them both out and we'll just go to mark 12 i don't have a page number for you sorry Part, mark 12 this is 33 through 39 it says in verse 33, at noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Didn't we talk last week that Nicodemus came in the night? There's things that happen in the darkness of the night. That's another teaching, isn't it? At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22. And when some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. Here it is, look at 37. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. The veil, the curtain, it torn too. 
It just ripped right in half. This thing would have been like six inches thick, 40 foot tall. This is a huge, huge curtain, embroidered, fancy, all the walls, everything inside this temple covered in gold, right? This was a big deal. And at that moment, the most holy of holy places that one guy one day a year was allowed to go in as long as he was near perfect, right? The, to the curtain that separated that ripped in half falling to the ground and behind it exposing the presence of God for the whole world, right? And we go and we see that the veil is curtain that separates us and all of us, we all now have access to God, right? And, uh-oh, there we go. And we all have the ability to be in his presence because when Jesus ascended into heaven and after defeating death and defeating the grave, he left us with the Holy Spirit and that is the actual presence of God in us. We don't actually have to go to a temple to try and get somewhat close to the presence of God. We actually get the presence of God. The spirit that Jesus gave up when he breathed his life, we get in us. And we get that with us all the time. Remember, we talked about being born again. When we repent, we give our life. We, we, we believe in Jesus that did all these things. We receive that gift. And we're going to talk about Holy Spirit towards the end of this and we're going to do some stuff with that and we heard this weekend I heard one of the one of the most amazing ways of describing uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit remember this he was saying that um, it's like Christmas when somebody gives you the best gift that you've always wanted and you just set it there but never open it right it's like there's a lot of us that have received the Holy Spirit we just haven't unlocked it we just haven't opened it we haven't experienced that it's like um, I, I have to be honest I, I grew up in a church uh, you know I went to church we talked about God the Father God the Son we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot and it wasn't until I started studying and digging in and, and having revelation of what the Holy Spirit does and the, and the gifting of that and the power of that and it's like wow right it's like having 13 seconds left, losing a game, and then you win. <laughs> that was for you, Bryce. That was for you, all right? It's the greatest gift in the world, right? Anyway, we do not have to go to the temple uh, where God dwells anymore. We get a full access, and we have to give, come to him with thanksgiving and praise anywhere, anytime. Like, yes, I believe in Jesus, and I have the Holy Spirit because I've been born again. I have that. Now I'm good. Like, Let's do something. Let's, let's use the power. Let's use what he has done. And, oh, here's a side note. Oh, my goodness. just choked on my spit. Um, where the temple is, uh, the temple was destroyed. They built the, the Dome of the Rock is on top of that. But there's still part of that temple, that Holy of Holies, where the tabernacle would have sat. It's still down underneath there. Do you know what it's called? Foundation Rock. Oh, how about that? I just learned that. So, anyway... You can, that's yeah, a quick, you know, that one was free. All right, so our response should be praise and worship to God. It should be praise and worship to God. And, and so not anything that we've done, but through us, healing can happen. Did you know that? Through us, demons can be cast out. Did you know that? I've seen it. it through us, the healing and, and that the, the lives can be changed, that, that the Holy Spirit can work in people and work on their lives. I continually pray. For people that I know there's no way on their own that they would ever step foot in a church, but I'm hoping that the Holy Spirit reaches out to them and smacks them in the face in Jesus' name, right? And does something for them because there's times I, I can't do anything about that. I'm too far away or this or that, but he can, right? Our response should be praise and worship to God. And it's time that we turn back to our first love. Please don't forsake the love you had at first for God. If you remember when you got blown up by, by the Holy Spirit, when you accepted Christ and it was just this joy that overcame and it's just this, this power that comes through. And, and, and for some of us, we're just like, I remember when I, when I got saved, man, I just uh, kicked the door open. Like, let's go, right? I got invited to my first men's encounter. I was like, let's go. We got we to gotta take over the world. We got to do that. We gotta, I was on fire. And then once I started, uh, you know, down that journey of becoming a Christian, of following that, then things got rough. And they're going to. That, they, they will. You will come under attack because the enemy doesn't want that. Right? Do not forsake the thanksgiving that you have for God. We have to be thankful for the things that he has done in our lives, for the things he's doing around us. We need to be thankful for the things that, that he's doing in this church. That we don't just take it for granted. That we just say, well, you know, that's what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to build up churches and people. And that's like, cool. Nice, right? We have to come with thanksgiving. And being in his presence has nothing to do with religion and everything to do with a relationship. We talked about that last week. And there's nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with a relationship. 
um, I think about that, that worship and that praise and lifting our voices to him and how that pleases him. Does anybody have um, that Christmas tree that's somewhere in your house during Christmas that's just filled with all the, the, the crap that your kids made at school? <laughs> right? I say that because to anybody else, it has zero value. Right? It has no value. It's it is popsicle sticks and, and leaves and cotton balls and M and M's from seven years ago. I mean there's just this tree that is like, I'm gonna put this ornament on there because my kid made this and brought it home. Oh you so, bless your heart. Right? That they actually thought and with the help of the school, right? They bring this gift home and they can't wait to give it this in the brown plastic bag. Remember it comes like, Oh, you can't open this till Christmas. You can't open this and you open it up and you're like, Oh, this is beautiful. And somebody that's visiting your house goes, what is that? And you're like, oh, my son made that for me. I love it. It has my name on it. It has D-U-D. I mean, it's supposed to say dad. It says dud, but it's okay. It's close enough, right? <laughs> Mommy spelled right. But, but it's like, it's beautiful. It's like, he, he made this for me. And there's times when our, our boys will come up and they'll sit on our lap and they'll go, dad, I love you. And it just... That one little thing, like, Dad, thank you so much. Um, Levi, from time to time, 10 years old. I'll hang out with him for five minutes, and we'll get a little bit of uh, father-son time. We'll drive to O'Reilly's. He gets, I don't know. And we'll put him down at bed once while he says, Dad, this is the best day ever. Hey, why? He goes, because I got to spend time with you. How much more do you think the Father in heaven? He's like, oh, it's my son. It's my daughter. And we come like, thank you. Thank you for the family that you lined up for me. I'm a turd to them, but they love me anyway. Thank you. Thank you for the job that I have, that I can put food on the table for these teenagers that never stop eating. Thank you, Jesus. I'm thankful for the, for the friends that, that, that the Lord has put in my teenagers' lives. I'm thankful for the teenagers in this community and for the families that are pouring into them and for those that are volunteering in the kids. That, that I'm so thankful for so many things that I never really think about much because I take it for granted. Yeah, we have a children's ministry. It's Lindsay's job. You know, she's the pastor's wife. She's supposed to take care of the kids. Nah, she has a heart for that that's not normal. And it's a blessing to sit in that. To sit at a men's encounter that it, people think is a cult. <laughs> it's just a bunch of dudes getting together. Yeah. 400 men lifting their voices in a way that you just sob listening to it. Yeah. Sitting in the presence of God, thankful to him. Yeah. Being thankful to him. Seeing brokenness being built back up. So, and seeing that in our families and in our lives that we've all gone through this thing we've all gone through the ups and the downs that when we're going through the downs God is still working he hasn't forsaken us he hasn't turned his back on us he's not going to do that my kids don't have, don't have the opportunity to unbe my children they don't get that option they're going to they're gonna rebel they're going to do things in life that we're not going to be happy with but they're still our sons and at the end of the day, there are some times where you just want to, you know, sell them into a circus. But then they do that crazy thing. They go, thank you. The dumbest thing last night, I asked Ethan to get me a bowl of cereal, and he did. I'm like, oh. oh. A teenage boy loves his dad so much. I didn't put the milk in the cereal away, but that's okay. It's like, Oh, he brought it to me and it was so full. It was overheaping. It's like, Dad, I didn't even bring you just a little. Yeah, it's just, it's piled up. And I'm just, he didn't say that. But I know he loved me so much that he made it to where it was falling out of the bowl as he was bringing it to me and the dogs were eating it. And it, who cares? Oh, this is great. I'm living the life because my 17-year-old brought me a bowl of cereal. How much more? Oh. How much more? There's this little, uh, there's this little uh, passage in Acts 13. There's some dudes at a church in Antioch. Barnabas is there, and it's in Luc Lucius of Cyrene. I'm going to start calling you Lucius because I love it. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart. While they were worshiping, he set apart. I think about this morning, 
as we were just worshiping, as we were praying. That we were just giving him thanks, that we were coming to him, being in his presence this morning as we're praying, we're worshiping, and we're just lifting our voices to him that, that he's setting us apart. Like, no, that's mine. You're set apart. You're not of this world. You are mine. And when we say, thank you for that. Thank you for, for giving me the grace and the faith to love you. Our kids had no choice, <laughs> right? They didn't ask to come. So when we come in thanksgiving, we praise him. I'm just going to keep repeating that over and over. Just that joy that he gets, that love that's like, oh, that's my children. I am looking forward to Wednesday um, because we are going to talk a little bit more about biblical ways to worship. We're going to talk about worship through prayer and fasting. I didn't hit on that today um, because we would have been here all day. <laughs> right? But we're going to talk about prayer and fasting, what that looks like. We're going to look at the personal devotion time. You alone, sitting in the presence of God, with God, having a conversation with your first love, should be. Again, I think about us that are married, that if we don't have conversations with our spouses, we aren't going to have that great of a relationship. Same with our children. Right? right. Think about my teenage boys. Ethan's getting ready to go off to college next year. If like, I'm trying to cram it in. Riley keeps taking my time, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm trying to cram in every minute I can with him right now. Spending that time in a relationship. That's what it's all about. So I'm going to pray, and um, we're going to have the ladies come up and worship. And this song is the heart of worship, right? Such a good song. Then there's the one after that. I can't remember. It ties into another one. I just got out of the way. I'm like, yeah, you just do your thing. But I'm thinking about it in this, this heart of worship. If we can get in the presence of that heart of worship... I'm going to ask Paul, I saw Linda come back in, and Lindsay's up here, Jimmy's up here, Rick's up here. Is, we, is anybody that, Aaron, if you just want to be prayed over, while that song's going, and we'll stay here as long as it takes, if you just want to be prayed over, I'm not even going to make you get up and come to the front. You just throw a finger up or a hand up. You just do a nod, and somebody will come pray over you. And if one of us doesn't see you, somebody is around him, just lay hands on him and pray over him. It is powerful what laying hands on somebody will do. You may not think, but if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the Spirit of God who can do the miracles, that can raise the dead, that can turn water into wine, that can do all the things. If you have the Spirit of that in you, what makes you think you do not have the power to heal? What makes you think you do not have power to speak into people's lives to encourage their spirit? We just stay here all day. It, it feels a lot better. So I'm going to pray and now have Leslie and the gang come up and, and sing this. I just want us to listen to these words and just sit in his presence. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you that your love for us It's huge. Father, I know that in my past, in, in where the direction I knew where I was headed in life, I knew exactly where I wanted to go. I knew where I didn't. That, Father, you believed in me way before I believed in you. Father, I'm so thankful that everybody in this room, you believed in them before they believed in you. And we give you thanks. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on that cross for our sins, knowing that we couldn't even come close to being perfect. It's hard just to be good. <laughs> when we give our hearts to you, we sit in your presence and we come with thankfulness, we come with praise that your heart is just filled Father, we love you. We thank you. We give all the glory to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.